Saddam Hussein's reign in Iraq was marked by a ruthless grip on power. A revolutionary through the Ba'ath Party ranks, Hussein would soon gain control of the entire country. From the late 1970s through the early 2000s, his government orchestrated a campaign of fear marked by the use of chemical weapons against his own people and neighboring countries. The most harrowing episode came in 1988 when Saddam ordered a chemical attack on the Kurdish town of Halabja, claiming thousands of innocent lives and etching a stark image of cruelty in the annals of modern history. Saddam's prisons were chambers of horror, where punishments and executions were a daily routine, a systematic approach to crush any form of opposition. Today we explore the cruel and treacherous reign of the man known to some historians as the last great dictator. And that is no compliment. At just 20 years old, Saddam Hussein joined the Arab Socialist Ba'ath Party in 1957. His storied career in Ba'athism would include intrigue, assassination attempts, a rise in power and Middle East politics would never be the same. The Ba'athist ideology was a mix of Arab nationalism, pan-Arabism, Arab socialism, and an anti-imperialist stance. Inspired by Gamal Abdel Nasser's Arab nationalist vision in Egypt, the nationalist revolution was alive and well in the 1950s Middle East. Nasser himself would represent the first domino of many revolutions across the Middle East, including Iraq. Just a year into his membership of the Ba'ath Party, Iraq would undergo its first of two revolutions in 10 years. On July 14, 1958, Iraqi military led by Major General Abd al-Karim Qasim would make history. Ordered to support King Hussein in Jordan, the Royal Iraqi Army instead turned and marched on their own country's capital, arriving in Baghdad. Qasim's forces stormed the royal palace and executed both the crown prince and King Faisal II. A new republic was proclaimed, and the Hashemite dynasty in Iraq was brought to an end. The Iraqi Republic was established, led by a revolutionary council, and by the end of the month, a provisional constitution was in place. Qasim would assume the role of the slain prime minister, but even the end of monarchy didn't mean Iraq's revolutionary verve was over. Despite a place in Qasim's cabinet, his Iraq first policy and lack of Arab nationalism would place the prime minister in the Ba'ath Party's sights, or more specifically, in Saddam Hussein's sights. Recruited by an assassination ring, Hussein would attempt Prime Minister Qasim in early October 1959. Unfortunately, it wasn't Hussein's task. He was only meant to provide cover fire. Qasim would survive, but his chauffeur wouldn't. While the assassination attempt was a failure, it would build Saddam's legacy within the Ba'ath Party and across revolutionary Iraq. Qasim would not last long. His premiership would end after the Ramadan Revolution in February 1963. Yet Saddam would keep rising. Abdul Rahman Arif would become president of Iraq, and despite spending two years in jail from 1964 to 66, Saddam would soon be deputy secretary of the Ba'ath Party. Following the bloodless coup of 1968, Hussein would spend a decade working as an effective backstage politician. Yet come 1979, despite a decade of rising living standards, incredible oil revenues, and unprecedented social welfare in the Middle East, Saddam Hussein would come to power. And soon after, there would be blood. A population under an iron fist. Saddam Hussein's leadership was always destined to bring political controversy. His legend in Iraq was built on an attempted assassination, and as deputy of the Ba'ath Party, he would gain acclaim across the Arab world. His defender of Iraq status, propagated by numerous writers and news columnists, came off the back of Egypt's decline and the Six-Day War of 1967. Yet Saddam's rise was always aided by internal repression. His propaganda was spread through columnists, but they were all paid off by his secret police. The Ba'athist security service was a creation of Saddam at least a decade before his presidency, and it solely answered to him. By 1979, Saddam was the de facto leader. He was the face of Iraq's politics and was in the perfect position to take over from the elderly Ahmed Hassan al-Bakr. Six days after his ascending to the presidency, the totalitarian style of Saddam Hussein was announced with a public purge of his party, calling an emergency party conference on July 22, 1979, which would be videotaped in a documentary style. Some 68 members of the Ba'ath Party were declared disloyal conspirators against his leadership and removed from the room one by one before being placed in custody. Tried and found to be treasonous, 22 were given the death sentence. Loyal members of Saddam's party made up the firing squad that would execute them. By the 1st of August, 
Saddam had ordered hundreds of party members to be killed. Saddam's iron fist was in response to the plurality of Iraq's many ethnicities, religions, and languages. To accomplish his repressive control of the population, Saddam employed numerous police and paramilitary forces. The People's Army was the internal security force looking to stop any coup attempts within Iraq. Orwellian in title, the Department of General Intelligence was a state security operation infamous for the horror it brought upon the Iraqi population. From the separatist Kurdish population in the north of Iraq to any suspected to be dissident, the threat of imprisonment, physical brutalization, and execution was never far away. Across the 1980s, some 50 to 70,000 Shia disappeared, never to be seen again. A similar number of Kurds and dissidents appeared at the same time. It's commonly believed they were killed at the hands of Saddam's security organizations. Human rights violations were common under this cult of personality. Arguably, none were more pronounced than the Unfall Campaign of 1988. The Unfall Campaign, a lower rung than war. Among many atrocities in what was a brutal conflict costing over one million lives, the Unfall Campaign would take place for eight months in 1988. While a noted incident of the Iran-Iraq War, this counterinsurgency was an attack on the Kurdish population. The conflict between Iraqis and the Kurds would go back to the Ottoman Empire and not end until the Iraq War of 2003. In this instance, Saddam Hussein's appetite for repression and violence upon minorities reached terrifying heights. A Human Rights Watch report some three years later would estimate as many as 50,000 to 100,000 were killed. Unfall would go on to become a symbolic event in Kurdish national identity. Unfall to most eyes was an effort to exterminate Kurdish populations across northern Iraq. Led by Saddam Hussein's cousin, Ali Hassan al-Majid, the eight-part campaign conducted mass deportations and the destruction of entire villages. Iraqi forces on the ground would use firing squads on civilians and were supported by aerial bombing runs. This alone caused a major fleeing of male Kurds in the northern provinces of Iraq, many crossing the border to Iran. The elderly, women and children were sent to Mujamat, camps under military auspices for the next three years. Yet it was the hideous, systemic use of chemical weapons that would make Anfal most deadly. In nearly all eight sections of the campaign, poison gas was used on villages in Bednan, Rwandese, Shaklawa, Askar, Boptapa, the Garmain region, and the Suleimaniya governorate. Scores of innocent Kurdish lives would be taken through the use of chemical weapons in Anfal, though none would gain more infamy than the Halabja massacre. Halabja, the Quiet Genocide What was supposed to be the closing days of the Iraq-Iran War produced an atrocity that history would never forget. In March 1988, during the opening stretch of the Anfal campaign, the village of Halabja would be victim of a poison gas attack. The later UN report would outline that mustard gas was used along with other nerve agents. This dark chapter in chemical warfare would be the biggest attack of chemical weapons on a civilian population in history. Three to five thousand innocent civilians would be killed in the attack, and over twice that amount would be injured. The catastrophic effects of this chemical attack would be felt in the years to come as birth defects and cancer rates soared in the region for years afterwards. In a scene belonging to the grimmest of horror films, the five-hour attack brought 14 bombings of Taboon, Sarin, VX, and mustard gas. Survivors would tell of the gas initially producing a scent of apples before its effects set in. Civilians were blinded, dying of laughter, paralysis, burning, and blistering, while others were heaving green vomit. It would take decades for the Halabja massacre to be seen for what it was, genocide. The Iran-Iraq war was coming to a close, but Saddam Hussein's reputation for shocking cruelty through chemical warfare and the eyes of world leaders were watching. Hussein in History Saddam Hussein's reputation for cruelty would be cemented with the Iran-Iraq War. The eight-year conflict would impact international relations and make military history in the darkest of possible ways. Territorial border disputes between the two neighboring nations were long-standing, but this near-decade-long war would prove most costly. Around half a million soldiers would be killed across the conflict, yet it would be the civilian casualties that would make the conflict's legacy. The Unfall campaign and the atrocities brought on the Kurdish population brought a genocidal element to the conflict, and it would be the first since World War I to use chemical weapons, on innocence no less. This war would end in a stalemate 
and cost over $1 trillion, though it had given the world a greater view of Saddam Hussein's treatment of civilians, the view into his domestic population, frequently suppressed. Historical analysis of Saddam Hussein and his rule is one of a cult of personality and cruelty through profound human rights violations. Over a 24-year rule, his imagery was rife across the country with thousands of walls covered in murals and posters of his image, projected as a courageous strongman and fearless modernizer. From airports to classrooms, from shops to office buildings, Saddam was everywhere in image. But so was a damning presence of suppression and his civilians facing the most brutal of physical punishments. Government-sanctioned executions, orchestration of physical brutality, and sexual violence all befell the people of Iraq in the name of its leader's control. Suppression of women was a common theme of Saddam's rule. Iraqi females could not leave the country without a male relative to escort them, and violence was nearly arbitrary. Uday Hussein, Saddam's eldest son, was believed to be profligate in brutality on women, as well as someone with his own private Iron Maiden for enemies. The surface of Saddam's rule was progressive and fearless. Its underbelly was brutal and horrifying. In an authoritarian regime, public safety is often substituted for the upkeep of a strongman's image. Saddam's Iraq was no different, with minorities, in particular the most vulnerable. Women suffered grave indignities and stripping of freedoms. The Kurdish population were subject to the most grisly of chemical warfare, and any brave enough to mount political opposition were likely to disappear, never to be seen again. Following his execution in 2006, historians tell us Saddam Hussein was one of the last great dictators, projecting an image of strength, but ruling with unabated fear. This is History on Fleek, and we'll see you next time.